All right. So, hello everyone, and welcome to our first single cell online seminar. I'm very glad to see that uh, so many of you made it, and I'm very excited also for this event because it's the first time. Uh, one thing that I have to mention to you is that we're going to be recording the seminar itself uh, for later use. So that's, that's something that you should keep in mind. And uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we think single cell analysis promises breakthrough results in the next few years. And we also believe that this in turn will revolutionize biology and also medicine. And because of this, we wanted to provide a platform for you, all of you and researchers to share what they are doing their research in and to make be able to learn about it as well. And also to connect with each other and, and have a platform for networking. And this is why uh, we are here with our two amazing presenters, uh, Quentin Verrill and Kirill Pirkovic. And I'm going to introduce them a little bit to you, a little bit of background uh, so that you can get to know them a little bit better. Uh, Quentin has recently attained his PhD at KTH, uh, Royal Institute of Technology. And he will be presenting about his research at uh, the SciLife Lab, but he was doing it at the SciLife Lab here. And at present day, he is working at Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, uh, Sweden. And his pioneering project in immunology combines semiconductor technology uh, with single cell analysis. I hope you're going to be uh, finding it as interesting as we did. Uh, our second presenter, Kiro Pirkovic, uh, finished his studies uh, at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Uh, Lomas of Moscow State University and went on to work as a postdoc here as well and then spent, sp spent six more years at MIT Media Lab and McGovern Institute. Currently, he is an assistant professor at Westlake University in China, uh, where he continued with his groundbreaking research in engineering fluorescent proteins. Now, you're, before we are going to continue with the presentations, uh, a little bit of information about how you can ask the questions, because uh, the, as you could see in the agenda as well, uh, each presentation is going to take 15 minutes and you're going to have the chance to ask questions uh, in between the presentations itself. Uh, this you can do by text, by simply putting it in a text form and messaging it into the group text of this meeting. And I will be able to read up, uh, the questions in order as they arrive. So please do that. Uh, it's, it's great if we can get as many questions as possible from you all. And uh, Without further ado, please welcome our first presenter, uh, Quentin Verum. Quentin, the stage is yours. Thank you, Balas. I will just um, share my screen. All right. So um, today I will present uh, about functional screening of individual NK cells and their selective retrieval as enabled by the cell sorter system. And, uh, and uh, as a uh, as it was mentioned, uh, I come from the Karinsk Institute and the, and the KDH Roy Institute of Technology in Stockholm, Sweden, and all the research that I showed today comes from Björn Unfeld's lab. Um, you can visit the website down below for more information. Um, so the outlook of my talk today, I will uh, briefly introduce natural killer cells and, uh, and their interest in immune therapy before moving on to um, functional screening in the micro -well chip that we use in our lab, and then uh, introduce how the cell sort of system has helped us perform direct isolation from the wells. So um, first, natural killer cells. So they're a population of innate immune cells, and they are mostly famous for recognizing tumor cells and virus-infected cells. And uh, the, when they recognize those cells, what they can do is actually do cytotoxicity, so killing tumor cells, or immunoregulation, signaling, and there are even evidence of long-term memory. And uh, what's quite interesting is that compared to maybe T cells, for instance, they do not uh, require antigen specificity. So instead, they, they use activating and inhibitory signals, and uh, the recognition is driven by that balance instead. And uh, to be able to recognize a wide variety of signals, uh, individual cells possess uh, quite different receptor phenotypes. So you have a very uh, diverse population if you take the, the, the entire pool of NK cells. And uh, what it might look like is something like this. So here we have um, two uh, tumor cells and we have an NK cell that will come in from the, from the side here. And for instance, uh, you see the NK cell migrating here to encounter the tumor cell and then induce uh, tumor cell death then. And um, these cells have quite an interesting potential in um, immune therapy. So what we mean by um, Immune therapy and in particular cell therapy is, for instance, if you have a patient here, uh, say a cancer patient, typically someone with leukemia, for instance, 
And you can either uh, retrieve cells directly from the patient or from, uh, from a healthy donor in case the patient's own cells are not viable. And then what you can do is um, some form of ex vivo expansion of the cells to then reinfuse them or infuse them into the patient and uh, have them target a the tumor then and uh, hopefully get uh, clearance of the tumor. And this can also be in, improved by adding uh, immune stimulating treatments, so for instance, uh, recombinant antibody therapy, since NK cells are also able to react to those and, uh, and get improved killing through that mechanism. Um, but what happens is that if you look at individual cells, uh, we realize that uh, we and other groups actually, of course, uh, realize that there's actually a minority of potent cells, for instance, if you take NK cells directly from, uh, from the donor or the patient. So we talk uh, sometimes about serial killing NK cells, for instance, and those represent typically five to 10% of a pool of NK cells. And so it's a quite, it's a relatively rare population. And in, uh, if you do an expansion that is uh, unspecific, then you would still get five to 10% of those cells in the final product. Uh, but, but ideally you would want to increase that proportion. And uh, for this, there are two uh, alternatives that we're exploring. And uh, one of them is doing some form of selective expansion. So where you would preferentially expand the cells that are of interest and, the, and then get them to dominate the final product before reinfusion. Um, but the other alternative that uh, the cell sorting system helps us uh, uh, put in practice is to instead select the cells already ahead based on their function. So where we can functionally screen the cells, select them uh, based on their performance and then expand them specifically before uh, reinfusing. And this holds in a way the, the promise of a tailored cell therapy product because you can just choose the functions that you want, expand them and then uh, reinfuse them. And uh, for <clears throat> this to be possible, we require uh, some form of functional screening. And in, uh, in Bernanfer's lab, what we use is a, is a micro well chip that you see here. So it's a silicon glass uh, chip. So uh, with material that I inspired from semiconductor um, fabrication, 22 millimeter side on the edge here. And it's, uh, we have wells etched into it. And then what we do is that we combine it with a soft rubber frame on top and mount it into a holder that is compatible with, with a microscope stages. So if we look at it from the side, it looks something like this. So here we have the silicon layer where we have those wells that are etched. So as you can see, they're rather narrow and quite deep. And, uh, and uh, this is to avoid cells escaping from one well to the other, for instance. Uh, the bottom of the wells is in glass, that's 170 microns, so it's comparable to what you would have in a, in a standard cover glass, so that we get actually excellent imaging properties from below. Um, and then the, the, the PMS frame uh, creates a reservoir at the top that we can fill with culture medium, so that you can keep the cells in culture for days or weeks, actually, in the in their wells. And uh, we have different uh, well geometries. Uh, the one that I want to, to highlight today is the, this geometry here. Uh, so it's 80 micrometer wide hexagonal wells in this honeycomb pattern. And this image that you see here would be one field of view of the microscope, so with a, with a 10x objective. And this would be um, 160 something uh, wells. And you have tens of thousands of wells across the entire chip. So each of the squares here would be one of those field of view. Um, and uh, so what it might look like in practice, something like this. So what we do is that we have a, a fluorescent uh, dye combination so that we can label live tumor cells here, uh, NK cells different, separately, and then we have a, a, a death marker so that we can see when tumor cells are dying. And then what we do is uh, time-lapse imaging. So for instance, something that looks like this. So where we see these NK cells going, going on and killing several targets in a row. Um, and here again, this is what we would define as a serial killing NK cell. And uh, so this is just one well, of course. Um, but you have to remember that we have many of those wells. So this would be one field of view of the microscope. And if you take it to the entirety of the ship, that is what you actually get. And of course, mounted in the holder there. Uh, what I showed there is a serial killing NK cell, but uh, I want to remind that this is a, actually a rather rare population, even though it's the most spectacular, so it's the one we show normally, but this would be a circling egg cell, while many cells actually don't even do anything in this period of time, or just make some contacts, but do not actually kill. Um, and uh, so what we uh, were interested in is uh, at the end of an assay like this, the cells are still contained in their wells, 
and you can keep them there for hours or days actually. So you have more than enough time to actually analyze the, the data from this um, assay and we do it automatically uh, with uh, our own image analysis software and then uh, retrieve the coordinates of the wells of interest where for instance, you would have a serial killing egg. Uh, and then the, so the cell sorter system we actually use to uh, retrieve the cells from the wells for further analysis. Uh, so the idea is quite simple, really, um, coming up from above with a glass micropipette, diving into the well, directly above, over the cell of interest, sucking it in into the, the pipette, and releasing it somewhere else. And uh, for us, uh, the system, the cell solar system uh, mounted looks like this. So we chose to use the piezo electric uh, system because it just gives us the, the volume precision and the fluid flow precision that we require to be able to really retrieve single cell, especially in this really uh, constraining geometry. Uh, and uh, so we've actually uh, built it into a, um, an environment control chamber, so uh, an incubation box basically on top of the microscope. Uh, the, the footprint of the system, it's quite small. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, uh, so we have this head here that, comp that includes a, a piezoelectric element and the head is moving up and down with this vertical stage. So all lateral movement is done by the microscope stage and this head is just moving up and down. So you keep quite a very straight uh, axis, which is really crucial for us to be able to enter the wells really with this uh, narrow opening. And then below the, the, uh, the head, you have those uh, rings here and those rings include um, L uh, LED illumination. So which uh, mimics uh, phase contrast illumination. And then you have this glass micropipette, you can you can have it in different uh, um, diameter at the end. We use a 20 micron uh, inner diameter at the end. So very, very narrow actually. And just because the, the geometry of our system is so constrained. And then we can uh, combine it with the chip holders that we normally use for, for, for analysis. And uh, so what we've done actually is to characterize the, the, the performance of this system at isolating cells. And uh, so we've, um, we first characterized it uh, to have some kind of reference. We characterize it in an open Petri dish, so a normal Petri dish using silica beads. So it's cell-sized um, glass beads, basically. And, uh, and uh, so get uh, uh, quantification on the, on the performance of the system. And uh, what we identify is that generally uh, lifting the beads is more sensitive than releasing them. This uh, happens in almost every single case. And uh, then we compare it to uh, isolating beads from the micro wells that we use instead. And uh, this plot's a bit complicated, but basically this each uh, green bar is a successfully picked bead compared to the distance from the center of the pipette. And so what we see is that uh, we reach uh, a maximum success rate towards the center of the, I mean, closer to the center of the pipette. And then at some point you kind of start losing effect. So it gives you a measure of the area of effect of uh, aspiration. And this is around 23 uh, micrometer then, which is uh, very similar to what you would see in an open dish actually. And uh, in the center, we reach, uh, we reach a, a success rate of around 73%, which is actually quite comparable to what we see in an open dish as well. And you have to remember also that uh, using a smaller, uh, uh, smaller pipettes and, and just uh, the, the, the geometry of the system makes it more sensitive to small variations. So it's uh, the success rate is actually really high considering the, the difficulty of this problem. And uh, we've also combined it with, uh, with fluid flow simulations, which actually pretty much predict a similar, um, a similar area of effect for the, for the biped in the wells. And uh, but what, uh, of course, is most interesting for us is uh, investing in primary NK cells. So we've uh, compared uh, two different uh, culture media, uh, one including EDTA to see if it would help releasing the cells from the bottom of the wells, uh, but we didn't see any difference. We reached pretty much the same level as actually with beads in the well, so around 75% uh, success rate. And uh, there is no significant difference either in the picking and the release. Uh, here it's a bit more balanced, uh, but it's not like the cells are getting stuck in the pipette or anything like that. And uh, we also check uh, survival and, uh, and uh, compared it to uh, low density seeded cells because they're not always comfortable in, in uh, in uh, surviving a uh, very low density seeding, but uh, we don't see any difference. So it seems that the, it appears that the, the system is very gentle at uh, lifting and releasing cells as well. Um, 
that's also what we appreciate with the piezo element is that we have really good control over the flow speed uh, in and out. And uh, uh, I thought I would illustrate what it might look like as a whole uh, process. Um, so, um, uh, so for instance, starting with an NKCL cytotoxicity screen, here you see the whole chip, and we're zooming into one single uh, field of view. So now it will uh, run as a time-lapse uh, video, and you see that some cells are dying, turning green, uh, and the NK cells in purple are making contact. Uh, and now we're just moving into a single well, just to illustrate this. Um, so this cell will proceed to kill one, two, and then successfully three targets in a row. So once again, one of those serial killing NK cells. Uh, but the advantage is that we can take the, this chip moving to another in a microscope where we can do single cell isolation then. And this is a lifetime video of the isolation of that very cell in this case, for instance. So here you see the cell in the bottom of the well. And the pipe is approaching very slowly to not actually dislodge the cell from the well, to not flush it out. And you will see the black ring of the pipette as it comes. And here it sucks up the cell. It lifts outside of the well. And uh, here for demonstration purposes, we just move to a different um, well or a different array in the same chip. And see the cell is still inside the pipette and we can release it there as well. So in this case, we release it, get just above the surface of the well. So that's why it can actually flow to the next well. Even if in this case, it's actually coming back to the correct one. And uh, then the, the pipette goes up and it's, uh, and uh, so we can see here the before and after image confirming that we picked that cell and actually nothing else from the well. So this is actually the precision that, uh, that we were really after. And uh, so in summary, uh, what I've shown now is that we can do on-chip uh, NK cell functional screening in micro wells at really a single cell level. And uh, I didn't present it in detail today, but we do automated image analysis and, and we can output the screening results. And then those um, coordinates, which are uh, well coordinates in the array, we can actually convert to microscope stage coordinates in the isolation microscope and then direct isolation from that uh, microscope. So we demonstrate here, for instance, direct isolation of single circling NK cells. And uh, with this, I would just like to thank you for your attention and thank uh, Bjorn Unfeld, who's leading this lab. So if you want to visit his website, feel free to do it. Uh, this is under the, the super, the, Umbrella of Kerensky Institute and KTH, the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. And then, of course, I want to thank the um, uh, funding agencies that make our research possible. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, we've actually gotten questions, so I will start uh, in order and I will ask you the first question. And it would be, for how long can you keep the cells in the micro wells? Uh, we can keep them for days or weeks. I think we've done the two or three weeks at most. The problem is that if you have cells that then to divide, then after a while you start getting quite crowded wells and it can, if you use uh, tumor cell lines, for instance, then they start to spill over from one well to the next. But they do survive uh, fine as long as you keep replacing medium. It's not a problem. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, for the, everyone else, you still have time to ask your questions during uh, the question and answer time. Uh, I will inform you if we are closing in the receiving of the questions. The next one would be, are the microwell arrays commercially available? They are not currently, uh, and it's, uh, so they are not. Uh, but if you're interested in using them, uh, we do uh, engage in, in the collaborations, so academic collaborations. So feel free to contact Bjorn and uh, I'm sure it can be discussed, but no, they're not commercially available. Okay, thank you very much. The third question is how the cells were seeded into the wells. So each will contain uh, one NK cells and five tumor cells. Uh, so it's stochastic seeding. So we do seed, seed the cells over the top of the wells and uh, try to resuspend so that you get quite even uh, seeding. But yes, in practice, it's stochastic. So you have, been, say, between three and, and maybe seven target cells per well. And uh, some wells have one NK, some one, some wells have zero or two. And uh, so, uh, but we have a very large number of wells, so all in all, it kind of evens out and we get a, uh, enough to analyze. But yes, we, it's stochastic. Okay, thank you very much. The next question is, how good is the recovery rate? 
Uh, yes, yeah, so the recovery rate today is around, um, I would say 75%. Um, uh, I should mention that, uh, that in most cases, we try to stick to cells that are far off um, or not too close to the walls. Uh, so we uh, set a 12, 15 micrometer distance minimum from the walls. We have some tolerance, so we have some margin to move around in the world, but that means also that you can't just select all the cells that have uh, that fit your um, uh, screening uh, criterion just because some of them uh, will be stuck in a wall and, and that is not accessible. Okay, thank you very much. Next question is, during the picking stage, how do you select the cells of interest? Uh, so in our case, uh, uh, you can either do it, uh, there are three ways I would say. You can either do it manually, so you, you uh, take a picture of the cells basically and just pinpoint the cells that you want and then the, the system will uh, calculate the coordinates required to go there. Uh, one way is to do automatic uh, image recognition on that same image, and that works as well. And then it will just uh, find the positions itself and go there. Um, and then, uh, so what we do is that we've uh, integrated uh, both the screening results so that it selects uh, the wells that it wants, and also the, uh, for instance, what I mentioned with the, the, the distance from the wells. So basically it, it knows in which region it's looking for the well, it takes an image, and then it selects the cells of interest that are far enough from the wells. Uh, but you can uh, integrate uh, those uh, three different aspects, I would say, in your system. Thank you very much. How much shear stress are cells experiencing during the picking step? Um, that's not something we quantified. Uh, I believe you guys have done it in uh, one of the earlier publications on the system, so I would refer to that. Uh, we have not calculated it, um, but you can... Uh, modulate down the, the, the flow rate and the uh, based on the, the time, uh, I mean, the, on, on the, the, the speed of the piezo. So you can try to, to tone it down, but uh, it would have to be calculated on your own system. And uh, once again, we use a 20 micron uh, pipette, so they are quite close to the size of the cell. So for us, they are quite, I mean, it's probably the most uh, shear stress that you could probably uh, induce in this case. But, uh, but of course, if your application is not as strict, you could use a wider pipette, say 50 or 100, and that, then you don't even have, a, you don't even clone close to the wall, so the shear stress shouldn't be too high. Actually. Okay, thank you very much. The next question is, is the isolation automatic, and what is the throughput? Uh, it's, uh, I would call it, call it semi-automatic uh, in the sense that, um, um, I mean, it depends on your setting. Uh, if you have, say, an open dish and you just select the cells, then you would just kind of give in the settings uh, uh, and uh, check the image analysis settings, and then it would probably run automatically. And I mean, from the bottom, the moment you press the start button, then it runs automatically to retrieve and release the cells. Uh, but uh, we are quite, we are double checking everything just because we are so. Uh, I mean, our application, if you crash, then if you crash into a wall, then it's over. So, uh, so we are double checking everything. Uh, the throughput, um, same uh, same answer. Um, the throughput depends a bit on your application. Um, because of the geometry of the wells, we have to go down very slowly. Otherwise, you tend to flush out everything. And so and that is actually slowing down quite uh, drastically. And so we have one cell maybe every 20 seconds. Uh, so in total, I mean, 15, 20 seconds. So it's in total, we can get tens or hundreds of cells max. Uh, but if you have a more open dish and you can, you can come down faster, uh, hundreds shouldn't be a problem. Okay, thank you very much. How many wells are there in one chip? Uh, I, I should know this. Um, it, it's, uh, I think, 25,000 or 30,000. I don't remember the exact number. Okay, uh, thank you. I much. should know this. It depends on the geometry. We have so many different, so that's uh, all. And how long will the screening process take to determine the killer cells? Um, uh, so the screening for us is, uh, is uh, anywhere between, I would say, four to 18 hours. Depends on your application, depends, uh, depends on your, how fast your cells kill and this kind of thing. Uh, if you have another readout, it might take shorter or longer. And then, but then you have to add up on the analysis as well, and that can take uh, anywhere up to, I would say, 24 hours, depending on a bit on the image, how many frames you have and so on. Okay, thank you very much. And is the uh, how long is the initial seeding stage? 
And that is not so long, actually. It's uh, maybe half an hour. All in all, uh, we let them sit for 10, 15 minutes, and then you have to do it twice because what we do is that we see the tumor cells first. We take a first image of the tumor cells to see which how many there are and which ones are or alive or dead so that we don't double count, double a cell that is dead before the NK cells are added. And then we see the NK cells on top, and that's another 15 minutes. So I would say half an hour around it. Okay, thank you very much. And are the selected cells grouped into one or multiple destination wells? Um, you can uh, see them. Um, I mean, you can see them separately. Uh, it's not a problem. Um, uh, you can see them in the same place, so you can see them separately. Both work. OK, thank you very much. Well, actually, that was our last question. From our, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Oh, sorry, we just got in a new one. Uh, just a second. So why use deep wells instead of normal wells? Uh, for us, it's really a matter of being able to keep cells a long time without them being able to climb from one well to, the, to another. Uh, we uh, adopted uh, 300 micrometer depth out of um, uh, uh, silicon wafer depth. Uh, we could probably run it at, say, 150 or something, and it should be fine. Uh, but many other people use maybe 50 or 100 and then you start seeing uh, contamination from one well to the next. So at least we can keep them for a really long period of time without them migrating at all, between wells at least. Okay, thank you very much. If there are no more questions, thank uh, then thank you very much for the presentation and for the very good answers. And uh, we would like to continue with the next presentation from Kirill Pietkovich. So I would like to give the stage to you, Kirill. All right. Do you see my screen? Yes, we can. Can you hear me well? All right. So, yeah, it was a great talk, uh, Quentin. Uh, pretty exciting application of cell picker. So, and I'm going to talk about cell picker assisted direct molecular evolution. So, it's quite a different uh, application. And uh, directed evolution is a powerful strategy for protein engineering, and my lab heavily uses for development of novel molecular tools for optical recording of uh, brain activity. And today I will focus on two major classes of uh, uh, molecular tools that we are developing. And first, I will talk about uh, genetically encoded. Uh, fluorescent voltage indicators. So voltage indicators report fast changes in plasma membrane potential, which, for example, happen during action potentials in neurons. And uh, transients in membrane voltage are detected by changes of fluorescent intensity of the uh, indicator. So, and in the second part of the talk, I will talk about uh, our present effort on development of novel fluorescent indicators for neuropeptides. And um, neuropeptides are small uh, chemical messengers with made up of short chains of amino acids, which typically, typically bind to uh, GPCRs in order to modulate neuronal activity. And uh, we can uh, utilize corresponding GPCRs to convert them into fluorescent indicators by fusing them to certain permutated GFP. So when neuropeptide bind to the GPCR GFP chimera, it increases its fluorescent brightness. And this is how we detect the uh, changes in uh, neuropeptide concentration. And uh, since we're going to be talking about uh, a lot uh, about directed molecular evolution. I think uh, I would like to also briefly introduce the concept of directed molecular evolution. So, uh, the, the directed molecular evolution usually consists of uh, several steps. So first step uh, is includes the genesis or recombination of the target uh, gene, parental gene, in order to create large uh, libraries, cDNA libraries with can, can contain as many as several millions uh, independent font. In our case, for example, the size of the libraries that we usually creating is about 100,000 to 10 million independent fonts. So once the mutant library is created, it's delivered to a cell 
in order to express the proteins for functional screening. And the second part of, uh, of uh, the rectal molecular pollution is screening for desired function, uh, depending on what kind of protein you, you're trying to develop. After uh, screening is done and the desired uh, cell is identified, the cell has to be isolated from this population because usually it's done in a bulk. In order to recover the gene that's responsible but for the protein, uh, and one selected gene is recovered, it can be subjected, subjected to a next round of directed molecular evolution. So for the application that we're trying to do, uh, the two most complicated, most difficult parts for us is a screening for desired function. When we are talking about fluorescent indicators for voltage and neuropeptides, we have to be aware of three major functions at the same time. We need to optimize brightness, membrane localization, and dynamic fluorescent changes uh, to physiological uh, process that we are measuring. So, and these three properties have to be measured at the same population of the cells. So given that we have up to several millions of plants, this can be quite complicated. And a uh, second difficult part for uh, direct molecular evolution of indicators is uh, selective isolation of targeted cells out of a bulk of a negative cell. So often in our screens, we have to isolate one single cell out of a tens or sometimes even hundreds non-functional cells. So we have to be very precise and uh, selective for picking the cells. So the one of the uh, best approach in order to get the was uh, high throughput screening and identification of the cells along multiple axes is combination of the uh, microscopy, automated microscopy and image analysis with robotic cell picture because it allows you to get the same cell image several times with high enough resolution so you can see membrane localization, you can detect the brightness as well as give you opportunity to image the same cell several times so you can see the changes of the rest. So for this end, we adapted a computer vision guided automated micro pipette capable of control suction and positive pressure to isolate single cells with fully automated microscope. And this is how our setup looks like. So it's slightly different from a setup that's been uh, presented by Quentin. And uh, for this setup, um, we were able to screen up to 300 cells expressing different metrics in the, in the course of four hours. So let's see how we implemented the cell picker for direct molecular so first step uh, of the direct molecular evolution, which is pretty, pretty trivial, is a, is a in vitro mutagenesis of a target gene. Once the target gene is uh, uh, prepared in the form of library, we transfect uh, the, the gene uh, in expression cassette into uh, EGK cells. So, and we do transfection. Uh, so uh, each transfected cell receive between uh, one to two copies of the plasmid. This is important in order to enable downstream uh, uh, connection between the protein and its sequence. So because if one cell will get more than one clone, it's very difficult to genotype the cell. And uh, one trick that we're using here actually is that we are using HEK293 cells, which are capable to amplify the plasmid due to the SV40 or replication. Why it's important? Because the um, <clears throat> plasmid delivery is happening using very simple methods. Uh, it's a calcium phosphate method, but we use very diluted library. And again, stochastically, we are getting only one cell, uh, only one plasmid per cell. Uh, most of the time, when we apply random mutagenesis, we have up to 99% of non-functional clones. And since we're dealing with the fluorescent indicators, it's very difficult, it's very difficult to have a non-functional clone by using 
parts. So we, we uh, after the cells are transfected and expressed in coprotein, we subjected to the flux to select fluorescent clones. Once fl the, the cells are selected, they are seeded on a uh, dish and cultured for 24 hours, so they have enough time to recover and attach to the surface of the, of the well. After the uh, 24 hours, we remove dead cells and put the cell and put the dish under a microscope and image entire uh, plates uh, and perform image analysis. In this case, for example, we were able to combine cell picker software uh, with MATLAB code that allow us online to segment the cells, identify single cells, and extract two parameters, brightness and localization. So these two parameters are important. We would like to have cells with the ideal membrane localization. At the same time, we would like to pick only those cells that have highest brightness among uh, well-localized cells. So this, this particular screen was done for voltage sensors and why it's important for sensors because we need to get the uh, protein localized to the brain place where the voltage in the cell exists. So once the analysis is done and we select the cells, we would like to pick. So we, we have cells with uh, negative or for example, don't possess high uh, membrane localization uh, are rejected and optimal combination of parameters cells are selected. After this, we apply a robotic cell picker that will go to each cell and gently remove it into a pipette and collect it into the tube. Uh, usually we collect all positive cells to a single tube. Uh, so let's see how it works in uh, real time. So this is pipette approaches with cells that have been selected. Apply negative pressure, cell gets into a pipette. Then it goes to the next uh, cell. And again, apply negative pressure and get it into a pipette. So in this regime, we can do screening. We, we can do the uh, picking of the cells pretty fast. So usually if we are collecting about 100 cells, we can do it within uh, several tens of minutes. So once the cells are uh, isolated, we move them into the PCR tube. Uh, so we don't grow cells after collection. We, have, we perform a whole genome amplification all by uh, PCR to amplify the target gene. After the target gene is amplified, we clone it back into expression vector and we isolate a single, in this case, single colonies for further DNA purification and transfection in, into HK cells. So we can now, on the population level, reassess same parameters, brightness and membrane localization. And since now the cells are going in a large quantity, we also can perform whole cell electrophysiology, uh, whole cell patch clump to characterize voltage sensitivity of a, of a uh, selected. Uh, so using this approach, we were able to, we, we, we performed two rounds of directed molecular evolution on a protein that had a very bad membrane localization and very weak voltage sensitivity in a, in a hierarchical form. So we started about uh, several millions of cells, uh, several millions of variants that had been transfected into several tens of millions of uh, HEP cells uh, enriched with uh, using uh, full photometry to go only for those that uh, possess fluorescence. After the selection using FOX, we apply cell picker to pick only those cells that are bright with a exclusive membrane localization. And then we perform electrophysiology and characterization and further characterization to pick only seven and two variants. So by doing this two rounds, 
we were able to convert uh, weekly uh, fluorescent uh, and uh, weekly sensitive template into the uh, into a voltage sensor, but outperform a template in along all three axes those screening curves. So brightness, membrane localization, and uh, voltage. So in the molecule we develop actually called Arcon, and uh, the performance of Arcon is actually quite exceptional to the point where we were able to perform in vivo voltage imaging uh, of this molecule in behaving mice. So we, for this, we use a pretty simple setup where we express using KEV voltage sensor in, in this case, particular in hippocampus, and we. Uh, use a red laser and uh, CMOS camera, high speed camera, to record action potential. Here is on the uh, right side of the screen, you see a cell body of a neuron in hippocampus in the animal while animal is running on a treadmill. So, and every time there is an action potential, you can see how the cell is spiking. So, this technology allows to for non-invasively uh, uh, recording of neuronal activity with single cell, single spike. So the uh, versatility or the, uh, the cell picker is so versatile that it can be adapted also for other applications. And uh, uh, second application we're using right now cell picker is development of uh, sensors for uh, neuromodulators and uh, in this particular case for uh, neuropeptides. And in order to screen the cells, for, uh, so we apply same strategy as I just discussed before for indicators where we create a large libraries of uh, individual clones. However, we need to perform one extra uh, screening uh, assay here it, on top of a brightness, fluorescent brightness and membrane localization. And we also need to assess the response of the uh, fluorescence to neuropeptides. Neuropeptides are pretty expensive uh, uh, reagents. And in order to screen, we have to use uh, nanoliters or uh, microliters of this neuropeptide for stimulation. And it was pretty simple to convert a uh, cell picker into a, a system for drug delivery with a, a very precisely controlled volume. So now uh, by getting the solution of neuropeptide into a, a capillar, we can approach the cell and apply the uh, neuropeptide right on top of a cell. So this allows us to save the neuropeptide. Otherwise, if you do it manually, you would probably overshoot the, the amount of a uh, solution. At the same time, we can do it in fully automated mode that save us time. And we were able to automate this uh, pretty simple setup based on a cell picker uh, where we can uh, perform targeted drug delivery with this very small volume, uh, well by well, and this done in, in, in this particular case, done in 96 well format, so the, uh, that been synchronized with the imaging. So in this case, when the pipette applies drug, we also see the fluorescent changes. Uh, you see examples here on the images below, but every time uh, we apply the drug, there is a change in fluorescence. So this change in fluorescence can be, uh, can be analyzed and we can extract, actually very interesting, we can, we can extract an additional parameter. Since we do the uh, uh, time-lapse imaging, we also can uh, see the kinetics of response. This is also important when we're developing the sensor because we would like to have, sen to, to have response to the sensors as fast as possible. So in principle, this setup allows us to assess four parameters at a time. And given the, its automation, we can screen multiple mutants 
uh, in the course of a day in automated mode with a further uh, analysis where we can extract two parameters. So, and uh, this graph actually showing importance of a screening of more than one parameter at a time because we resolve this a trade off between brightness and uh, changes of fluorescence in response to the neuropeptide. So, the most uh, uh, the brightest mutants usually have low delta F or F, while uh, dimmest mutants have higher delta F or F. Uh, so, I gave an example of just two uh, indicators that we are developing, but as you can imagine it can be uh, generalized to other uh, sensors as well. And uh, here I would like to acknowledge. Uh, my postdoc supervisor at Boden, because most of the work for voltage sensor has been done in his lab. Uh, we keep doing uh, the development of the voltage sensor, so it's very similar to what has been done before, just using new templates. Uh, the in vivo voltage imaging was done in collaboration with Shuhan Lab at Boston University. And uh, of course, I would like to give a special thanks to the cell sorter company. Uh, technical support and uh, uh, this project were possible with, uh, was only possible with uh, their technical support. Uh, the uh, neuropeptide screening was done in my lab by uh, San Sao and Guaten Lan. And of course, I would like to uh, acknowledge funding agency that makes our research possible. It's uh, Brandon Behavioral Foundation. Uh, Natural Science Foundation of China and uh, West Lake. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm happy to take your question. Thank you very much for the excellent presentation, Carol. I would like to encourage everyone else to ask your questions. It can be uh, in any way related to the topic. So uh, we have only received three so far. I will start with the first one, but please do feel free to ask your questions, uh, even in the question and answer period as well. So the first one is, can you use this method for engineering non-fluorescent proteins as well? Uh, in principle, yes. Uh, since we're using, since the cell picker in our case is combined with the fluorescent microscope, uh, you have to link somehow the function of your protein to certain fluorescent assay. And can, I can give an example. You can develop, for example, kinases, but in this case, you need to link the uh, activity of a kinase to the fluorescence, for example, by uh, uh, turning the substrate of a kinase to the fluorescence of the kinase is activated. Uh, in principle, you can also develop enzymes, other types of enzymes, as long as you can make their function somehow to uh, lead to the fluorescence. Uh, another, another case is the, for example, if a sensor or if a molecule trying to develop somehow can be read out through the uh, morphology of the cells, because you can see, uh, you can image the cells in KAC and see where. Thank you very much. The next question is, how many cells can you screen for cell picking in an experiment? Uh, how many, so, in, uh, in the modification of a cell picker we have, we use a three centimeters uh, dish, and we have to uh, plate uh, cells, and uh, you, you see it on this video, we have to plate the cells approximately 50 to 100 mic micrometers apart, that give us roughly uh, uh, 250 to 100,000 uh, cells per three centimeter dish. So I would say, uh, this is how many cells you can screen per, uh, per one dish, but you always can get 10 cells, or 10 wells. It's not I don't care. Okay, thank you very much. Is the neuropeptide delivery done automatically? Yes, neuropeptide delivery done automatically, and this is the point. Uh, so we have, uh, we screened over 100 so, uh, mutants, and we have to be consistent with wells. It means that delivery has to be done uh, very precisely. Uh, and also we do synchronize the uh, neuropeptide delivery and imaging. But we know 
then uh, neuropeptide was uh, released onto the cells to measure the kinetics. Yes. And how long does it usually need to screen one library for voltage sensitivity? Oh, yeah, very, very good question. So uh, the voltage sensitivity actually uh, was decoupled from a uh, cell picker itself. Uh, voltage sensitivity was done using uh, trans uh, induced transmembrane voltage. Uh, let me the first slide. So we usually uh, using use transmembrane voltage and the uh, whole cell patch clamp we screen several hundreds of mutants. And uh, several hundreds of mutants can be done also in the course of a day uh, by applying electric field to the uh, pair of electrodes and, uh, and imaging the response. Thank you very much. The next question, and so far the last one that we have, if nobody else has questions, is what is the biggest challenge in setting up the experimental protocol? Biggest challenge. So uh, the uh, screening, the, the most important part, the most crucial part of the screening, you have uh, thousands of thousands of cells on the uh, dish, and you need to identify uh, what cell have what cell has to be picked up, and usually it's done by heavy imaging analysis. So, and I, and I give you an example, uh, and it has to be done also fast. Example here, when we are analyzing four different parameters at a time, it means you need to be able to analyze it also in automated mode. What uh, brightness the depth of RF and kinetics happening at the same time? So I would say for us, the most challenging is to uh, perform imaging uh, uh, online imaging analysis. So after imaging is done, we we know what cells to pick out of hundreds of thousands of cells. Thank you very much. And there's one more question. Uh, was the experimental setup for automation developed in-house or is it a standard product from cell solder? Uh, so, so both setups that I presented, you, you, you can see they are slightly different. Uh, the setup we are currently using uh, in the lab been uh, fully purchased from a cell picker uh, company. Uh, however, the first one that I bought when I was at MIT uh, was actually a custom build because we were integrating on our microscope. And this is one of the great thing about uh, this system is that in principle, you, you can integrate it on any microscope, uh, on any inverted microscope you have. Uh, and I believe it's compatible with uh, many different stages and many different uh, cameras, as well as many different microscopes. So, uh, all you need just micro manipulator, uh, pump, automatic pump, and the uh, fluidic control system. And in principle, you can set it up on any microscope. Uh, another thing that we also integrate with system with a uh, MATLAB for, for example, for our custom uh, image analysis. And as I give you an example here, uh, when the cell picker is saving uh, images, it goes to a folder. And this folder uh, and MATLAB code uh, taking the images from the folder, analyzing it uh, in real time, and uh, giving us the uh, output for the cell parameters. And once the cell parameters are identified, we threshold them and uh, decide how many cells we want to pick. So, and the drug delivery system is a very simple modification of. Uh, existing uh, cell picker where we just connect the pump directly to a micro pipette. And it's also controlled by the cell picker software. Thank you very much. And we've got one more question. Is the image analysis done using the hardware provided or is it specific to your group? Oh, so the, the one we are using is specific to, to our group, but I think First version, for example, of voltage sensors, uh, I think we shared it on GitHub. Uh, so whoever wanted to can use it, uh, download it and use it in GitHub. 
Uh, I think in our original paper, we provided the link to GitHub. Okay, thank you very much. And if there are no other questions, then this was the last one that I could ask you. Uh, okay. Thank you very much for your excellent presentation and for being here and joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. And uh, yeah, thank you for having me here. And to everyone else, uh, there is one more question that I've been asked. Uh, I think this is uh, more proper if I answer it, is uh, if there is a chance to get to the recording of this seminar. Uh, if you're interested in, in getting uh, the recording, then I will be able to give it to you. We are going to be able to share it as well uh, on our page. Uh, you can contact me in email or in uh, on LinkedIn as well. And uh, one more thing, the last thing that I would like to ask you to do is to fill out this uh, very quick uh, feedback form uh, for us so that we can improve our, our next seminar that we're going to organize. I promise you it's not going to take you more than one and a half minutes. It's, it's very quick, a few questions. If you could fill it out, it would be a great help for me. So again, Kirill, Quentin, thank you very much for your excellent presentations today. So, sorry, where, where, do I get, uh, where, where do I find the feedback oh, yeah. form? Uh, the, the feedback form is uh, sent in the chat in here. I'm oh, going in to the chat, to, okay. Yeah, it's in the chat on this link. I'm going to be able to send it to everyone else in, uh, in messages yeah. as well on LinkedIn, but here's also a QR code for it if this is easier for you. I will uh, leave it here for a few seconds so that you can scan it and, and you are going to be able to uh, fill it out on your phone. And with that, I would like to uh, say goodbye to you all. Thank you for joining us today.